OK, thanks a lot, Duncan. So um, as Duncan mentioned, what we're going to talk about today is using ambisonics um, or creating an ambisonic mix inside this room. Uh, you could do it anywhere, as it happens. Um, but the idea is to make it so that we'll, we'll mark it and you'll do the final mixing inside this room as well. So this is obviously for the, the kind of the, the, the extra challenge bit of your assignment. So for a good kind of honours grade, uh, you'll need to attempt this. Um, and everything I'm talking about today, there are little online videos of me repeating it and going through it in a bit more detail. The, the videos that are currently up on my website, um, which is there, so brucewiggins.co.uk, the videos that are currently on there are kind of one version behind in Reaper, but it looks, almost, it looks very similar and there's very little difference really. There's just a few extra shortcuts in this version. Um, when compared to the last one. So for example, we used to have to do everything in stereo pairs. Now we can just say, open a 24 channel track and everything is fine. Um, I'll explain that as I go along. So what I'll do first of all is I'll talk a little bit about ambisonics and what it is. Not in great detail, but just enough for you to get some understanding of where it's coming from, I guess. And the differences between ambisonics and most other kind of pair or triple wise pan systems. And then we'll talk about how to do it in Reaper, which is the uh, DAW of choice when it comes to doing um, surround sound stuff that isn't just 5.1 or quad, basically, and why we use that. And then a bit about my plugins, and then I'll do a demo of setting it all up and getting it all running. running. So what is Ambisonics, first of all? Well, it's a system that was developed or started to be developed in the 1970s uh, by a guy called Michael Gerzen. There were others working on similar... Uh, techniques at the same time, both in the US and over here. But in a nutshell, it's a, a system based on a coincident miking technique, if you like. So meaning that if we wanted to record something for Amazonics, it would make sure all the microphone capsules are in exactly the same place, uh, <coughs> same point in space, um, which is essentially an extension of the original stereo proposed by Alan Blumline. This PowerPoint will be uh, made available online, so you can click these links for a bit of further discussion. Um, and the original stereo proposed by Alan Blumline is pretty much what you get on a mixing desk when you're turning your pan pot. What that pan pot is doing is it's simulating two coincident microphones, uh, directional microphones, so when you turn your pan pot you just get a different amplitude between the two channels, yes? Um, Ambisonics is extending that for, for more uh, signals, which will then be mapped in some way across um, the speaker. Uh, the speakers that we've got in this room or any other room, if we know where they are. So that's what we're doing. My panners will basically simulate this coincident mic. So what are, well, what's the main difference between ambisonics and uh, your normal surround sound techniques? Why aren't we just using logic, uh, opening a 5.1 panner, and then just pl putting stuff where we want it to come from and, and jobs are good, and that's all sorted. Well, ambisonics is slightly different and then it adds an extra step in that the actual encoding part of the system, or the panning, is separated from the decoding part of the system, which is the generation of speaker feeds. Normally when you use a panner in Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase or whatever, in goes your audio, you move a little puck around telling you where it wants to be, and out pops speaker feeds. That's how normally a panner works. In Ambisonics, there's this extra layer where what pops out of the panner isn't speaker feeds. It's a group of, or collection of signals which represents an entire three-dimensional sound field. Uh, in this case, it's called B format. It consists of four channels, which I'll show you the, the, the mic patterns for those four channels in a minute. Once we've got this intermediate format, we can use it, uh, just a simple linear combination of these four signals to create um, virtual speaker feeds pointing in any direction in, in 3D space. And that's the point. We can do that with these four signals, these four B format signals. And the job of the decoder is to take in those four signals and decide what the best thing to feed all these speakers is to get the best rendition of it where you're sitting. It is based on a sweet spot, so as you will get the best thing out the middle, uh, the best um, performance from a listener's point of view from the centre, the sweet spot, um, but it works pretty well um, in other places as well, although obviously what you hear will be slightly different depending on where you sit. <coughs> um, the pieces you heard on the way in, incidentally, they are pieces from past assignments in this module. So they're students second years doing computer system, uh, computer music systems, those two pieces. I'll show you another one or two at the end. 
<laughs> so as long as I know where the speaker positions are, I can make a decoder for them. You'll be uh, using 20, these 24 speakers to render your audio, but the point is, once you've mixed it, uh, as it happens for these 24 speakers, you could just change the switch on the decoder and you could generate a 5.1 speaker version or you could generate a 4 speaker version or a 64 speaker version, depending on where it is you want to perform this particular or present this particular piece of music. Um, so this is what the panner kicks out, or we have, we've got a sound field microphone as well, which actually directly records these, but you've got basically an omnidirectional feed called W, and then you've got three figure of eights. A front back figure of eight, a left right figure of eight, and an up down figure of eight. And then using any combination of these three figure of eights, you can make a figure of eight pointing in any direction, just batting them together. And if you mix that with the omni, you can make any first order polar pattern, so through from Figure of eight, hypercardioid, cardioid, subcardioid, only. So just by crossfading these things. So that's what the decoder does, just mixes these signals together in a, a certain way. So why would you want it? Well, if we can decode our mix over different speaker arrays without having to remix it, that's the point. So the idea of the decoder is to present it over different speaker arrays but keeping the level balance between the instruments the same, keeping the positional information of where they are the same as much as possible, it depends a bit on the speaker array. If we've got no up and down speakers, we're going to struggle to get height. If we've got a massive gap at the back, like you have in a 5.1, you will get stuff panned at the back, but it's very dependent upon where you're sitting. Uh, but it keeps, as much as possible, all of that information the same. So there's, you know, how spacious it sounds, how the reverb performs, where the, the actual sources are, the level balance between them. So you shouldn't have to remix it for different speaker arrays. If you're presenting it in a large area, it's much better that you use lots of smaller speakers rather than five massive ones. So if you did write a 5.1 piece that was going to be distributed on DVD video, um, to perform that in somewhere that holds 300 people, putting five big speakers just doesn't really work. It just sounds like five big speakers, and that's all you'll hear. You know, you'll hear five places of stuff. Uh, much better to use more smaller speakers or more big speakers, depending on what you want. Uh, stereo and mono compatible as well, uh, which is still in, uh, very important in broadcast, because there's no uh, time delays or spacing or comb filtering, and we can decode it to whatever we want. So that's ambisonics. The main difference in practice for using ambisonics, as well as this intermediate format, is that all of the speakers are pretty much used all of the time. Normally, when you're doing pairwise panning, if you wanted to pan something to the front, you just use these two speakers. If you want to pan it at a speaker location, you just use that speaker. Ambisonics will use pretty much all the speakers, no matter where you put it. Makes it equally wrong everywhere, as it happens. Um, that can be a good thing, it makes the speakers kind of disappear, not stick out in the mix. But it means that uh, for some sources, you, know, you, know, you, you, could get, you couldn't get a better source than just using a, a speaker, because that is definitely coming from there. Ambisonics won't give you as sharp localization as that necessarily, because you're always using more speakers to reproduce the sound wave. <coughs> uh, but in other ways, it's much more flexible. So the bit of software we use to implement this, well, there's two bit of software. There's the, the DAW that we're using, which is called Reaper. Uh, Reaper is a reasonably priced Windows and Mac, as it happens. When I wrote this slide a few years ago, uh, it was only available on Windows. You can use it on Mac now as well. Uh, software for multi-track audio production, developed by the author of Winamp uh, and another guy. Um, and it requires no dongle, has no copy protection, and can be evaluated with full functionality. It's very good value for money. To buy a license is about $60. Uh, if you compare that to like Logic or Keybase or whatever, very good value. Uh, you can try it out, you can evaluate it for up to 30 days with full functionality. After those 30 days, it just starts nagging you. So uh, after 30 days, you should buy a license if you're continuing to use it, but obviously that's up to your kind of scruples as to whether you do. But it is the price of a, a textbook, basically. It's very good value for money. So I'd recommend if you do keep using Reaper that you do actually purchase uh, a non-commercial license, which is what this $60 license is. So that's one good thing about it. You can try it out uh, for free for 30 days. Um, it's also one of the most flexible multi-channel hosts. It's very um, Logic, Cubase, Pro Tools are very speaker-centric. If you put in a new track, it'll often say, well, what is this track? Is it stereo? Is it quad? Is it 5.1? And if you want to say, well, it's none of those things, well, you just say, is it quad or is it 5.1? Which one is it? Surround sound. In Reaper, you can just say, just says, how many channels do you want for your track? And that could be up to 64 at the moment. So you can just say, I want a 24 channel track, which can output these speakers. I want some four channel tracks. I want some eight channel tracks. Do whatever you want. 
Also, it doesn't try and be clever about what plugins you put on what tracks. So for example, if I have an eight channel plugin, I could put that on a mono track, or I could put it on a four channel track, or I could put it on a 64 channel track. And you can tell it which tracks need mapping to which channel of your plugin. That's a good thing, because often the channel counts change depending on the input and output in Amazonics. Um, lots of other digital audio workstations don't like that. If, you haven't, if you've got a 5.1 track, it must be a 5.1 plugin to go on that 5.1 track. You can't use anything else. That, that can be really problematic for Amazonics. So we want to do that all the time. So Reaper's really good in that it just leaves you alone to do what you're going to do. It doesn't do any kind of secret mixing in the background or anything else, which some of the other doors sometimes do. Screenshot of Reaper. Looks pretty much like every other door in the universe. Um, horizontal timeline based editing. Uh, no surprises there, hopefully. So the other bit we need to do Amazonics and Reaper is I've written a load of plugins which you can use um, to do the panning and to do the decoding and also for like a 3D reverb. So the things you've got to play with in this uh, assignment is you'll do most of your production and most of your kind of audio creation and mixing and, and development in some other package, Logic or whatever. You'll then output those finished stems to mono WAV files, hopefully, or AIFF files or whatever you want. Then you'll import them into Reaper, and you can use my plugins to do some panning. Uh, you can use my plug other plugin to do some decoding, and also you've got access to a 3D reverb should you want to use a, a proper 3D reverb as opposed to some reverb bits that you plan around, which you could do as well. Uh, in terms of the panners, there are two versions. There's a two-dimensional drag a little puck around version, which is what most people prefer. All we're expecting you to do in this assignment is to kind of pan horizontally. You're welcome to experiment with height. Uh, height is much less obvious than you think when it comes to panning things up and down, mainly because this room isn't very high. So there's only so much you can do. So all we really expect is some horizontal investigation in this and panning. Uh, or there's another plugin where you can choose angle. Azimuth angle is horizontally, where is it? Elevation angle, you can choose up down, and then distance, you can move things in from the, from the edge. Well, I'll explain what I do in a minute. Underneath the, the front end, the graphical user interface, both plugins are absolutely identical. So when it comes to automating the plugins, you can actually automate either the coordinates of where this thing is in terms of x, y, z, x being front back, y being left, right, and z being up down. Or you can automate the angles. So you can, if you want something to move around in an arc, then just automate the azimuth angle and make it go around in a circle. You know, if you want it to move kind of along that way. If you want it to go in a straight line, then alter the coordinates to go front, back, left, right, or whatever you want. You can automate all of it. So underneath the, the graphical user interface, the, the controls are exactly the same if you turn it off that GUI. And then the, the reverb will have a look at in a little while. No fancy GUI for that. Uh, works much like every other reverb with room size, damping, spread, that kind of stuff. So we'll have a look at that too. So we need to have a bit of background as to the kind of routing concepts for this uh, demo. So what we're looking at is doing this kind of thing. So what comes out, what goes into my panners will be a mono feed, a single channel. What comes out of all of my panners are four channels. So the Omni and the three figure of eight, the front, back, left, right, up, down. And then all of those will be sent to some summing bus. You might have a drive bus, you might have a reverb bus. So you can do like a kind of aux send reverb thing where you can change the balance. You might have multiple reverb buses if you want to send different channels to different reverbs. Some might want not any reverbs at all. And then you'll have a total kind of summing bus. This is very important because it's this track that you'll be able to export as a four channel WAV file to hand in that will be your entire 3D mix contained within four channels. There's no loss of quality there. That just is everything to do with your mix. You can't pull it apart again and change the level balances, but there's certain things you can certainly do. Uh, Redecoding it is one. And then that will be sent to the decoder, which goes to however many speakers we're going to use. Today we'll use 24 speakers, but for trying it out at home, there's a quad decoder, or there's a 5.1 decoder, or you can do whatever. Uh, and my plugins do are available for Mac and PC. So if you do your development on a Mac, you can try it out at home using my plugins and then bring it in to the PC. And as long as you're using the same plugins, which you will be, um, it'll just recognize the PC versions of those plugins and allow you to go between the two platforms seamlessly. 
which is very useful as Macs are becoming more popular for music production, uh, but it's a PC in this particular room. So that's what we're going to recreate in Reaper today. Uh, and that's what you'll be recreating in Reaper to do your mix. There will be some blank template, templates available, or there are some blank templates available on my website, uh, but it helps to know how it's rooted in case you don't want to do exactly what's done in my blank templates. So for example, in my template, everything is sent to the reverb in equal proportions. Um, so if you don't want some things to be sent to reverb, you need to know how it was set up in the first place. And that's the point of this little demo. Uh, so what we'll do now, well, first of all, I'll pause for questions and breath. Any questions at this point? Go on. So any, any files you've put into Reaper has to be mono to work with? We'll talk about that in more detail in a second. Uh, if it's better if you export mono stems. Okay. If you've got stereo stuff, like some kind of stereo effect, it's better if you, out, if you export that as two mono stems. Uh, logic seems to be quite problematic to get it to do that. You can do it, but it, you have to go searching for some tick box somewhere. Um, if it does come out of stereo, I'll show you how to, you can make it mono in uh, Reaper itself without having to destructively edit it. So it's not a problem. But if you're mono to start off with, everything's a bit simpler. Any other questions at this point? No? Marvellous. Okay.